using IELTS listening test. There is a good news for you guys. Now you can practice unlimited speaking tests on our application Baby Code. I know, I know. Some people will say कि मैं तो अपने friends के साथ practice कर लेता हूँ. मैं अपने institute में रोज test देता हूँ. या मैं Miller के सामने practice करता हूँ. लेकिन रोज एक या दो test देना is not enough to clear IELTS. और आपके friends और Miller आपको valuable feedback कभी नहीं दे सकते. लेकिन अगर आप Baby Code application use करते हो, तो आप कहीं भी और कभी भी unlimited test दे सकते हो. Baby code practice karna is like having a personal teacher. App will take exam like a real examiner. After test, you can check your grammar, fluency or pronunciation mistakes. Even you can check your band score. This app will provide you free test every day. So do not forget to try. Link in the description. But if you need more test access, it will just cost you $3.99. Wait, if you use my promo code IELTS50, that will give you even more 50 rupees discount. Now it's like a one-time meal money, but this will help you to crack your IELTS exam. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the Student Union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for 10 years. I'm just the third owner and my mother had it before me, so we know its history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it, unfortunately. It's been a good car. You want $1,500, is that right? I was asking $2,000, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um, well, I finish classes at 6 o'clock. How about straight after that? Say, 6.30? Great, I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right, that's Princess Street. I'm at number 88 on the right. So it's 80 Princess Street? No, it's 88 Princess Street and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one with the for sale sign on it. OK, thanks Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Later that day, at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam and tells him about the car. Hi Sam. Hey Jan, what's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up. 
I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So what kind of car are you looking at? It's an 85 Celica, same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking $1,500. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know, I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look at about 6.30? Sure, I'll come, but I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea. But won't it cost a lot? Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for $80, and it comes with a report on the condition of the car. It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at 6.30. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every 15 minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually, I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. OK, great. See you at six, outside the student centre. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear two flatmates, Tom and Richard, talking about their new flatmate who has just moved in the week before. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hi, Richard. I'm glad I caught you here. Can I just talk to you about something? Our new flatmate, Anders, is not quite what I had hoped. I was wondering if you shared my concerns about some of his behaviour. Uh, yes, Tom. I, I know what you mean, but we can't be entirely negative. He, he has good points. I mean, at least he's quiet. He doesn't play loud music all night or bother others or turn his TV up, disturbing everyone. Sure, he's quiet. But remember our last flatmate? He'd say hi to you and smile and treat everyone politely. In comparison, this new guy is very impolite. He just grunts in reply and sometimes ignores me altogether. I guess that's just his way. You know, just his character. I don't think he realises he's being impolite and it shouldn't matter to us too much. We can just ignore him too and quietly live our own lives. But his friends are hard to ignore when they visit. I know what you mean, but how often does that happen? I rarely see them, maybe once or twice a month. If they came more often, it might be a problem. But as it is, such rare visits don't matter so much. Wouldn't you say so? Well, I'm not sure, since it's very obvious when they're here because of all the cigarette smoke in the house. It stinks up the place, and you know we don't allow smoking on the premises. Well, I've never seen them doing this. Maybe they do it outside. Perhaps we can talk to Anders about it. Always remember, though, in one respect, he's a good tenant, and it's the most important aspect. The previous flatmate would always pay the rent late. I know what you're going to say. This guy pays promptly. But there's more to being a good tenant than prompt payment. 
I mean, you need to turn off the TV, clean up your dishes, dress respectably, be polite, and so on. I guess what I'm saying is that basically you need to cooperate with the others, and this new guy fails significantly in this respect. Okay, I suppose you have a point there. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. I tell you what, Tom. Why don't we talk to our new flatmate Anders about these issues? If we throw him out, we'll have to go to all the trouble of finding another flatmate who might not necessarily be much better. So let's give the current guy a chance. Here, I've got a piece of paper. So let's make a short list of issues to discuss with him. Get it out into the open. Sure. We'll give him one more chance. So write communication. And let's tell him to. Well, we can't change a person's personality overnight, so why don't we have a weekly tenants' meeting, and we can just ask him to attend. That way, we can get to know him better. I'll write attend meeting, and we can take it from there. Okay, but we have to tell him about his friends. They can't just do whatever they want. Write a heading friends, and then write don't smoke anywhere, inside or outside. Well. Instead of being so direct and possibly causing offence, I'll just write follow rules and verbally mention the rules. TV off by ten p.m. No loud music or bad behaviour, including smoking. Okay, do that. But I still think we need to specifically mention that last issue. You know how I can't stand the habit, so I'd like this to be another and separate point. Cigarettes strictly forbidden. And it's important to include the strictly here. We can't pussyfoot around too much. Sometimes directness is necessary. Okay, I'll write that. Forbidden. Okay. And what about cleaning duties? Anders is a little too relaxed about that. Dishes are sometimes not washed. Dirty teacups are left around the place, and so on. So write must do better. Yeah. Again, Tom, he might take that personally, and it could cause a scene. I'd rather be general. I'll write "must be done," and I'll tell him that that's for everyone, not just him. Okay? Okay. As long as he gets the message. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for twenty years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. 
but it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university, even with the change in your everyday duties? I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip, Professor Nitik. Could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> An average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon, and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university, showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. <clears throat> Last week, we looked at some of the features of modern houses. And today, we're going to turn the clock back and look at traditional house design. I've chosen to start with Samoa, which is part of a group of Polynesian islands in the South Pacific Sea, because the influence of culture and weather on house design is quite clear there. Um, so let's have a look at, first of all, at the overall design of a traditional Samoan house. Now, these days, houses in Samoa have become more modern and are usually rectangular. But traditional designs were round or sometimes they were oval in shape. Here's a picture. This traditional style is still used, often for guest houses or meeting houses, and most Samoan villages have at least one of these buildings. As you can see, there are no walls, so the air circulates freely around the house. Samoa is a place that experiences high temperatures, but the open design of the house also reflects the openness of Samoan society. If the occupants want shelter, there are several blinds made of coconut leaves that can be lowered during rainy or windy weather. Or indeed, the blinds can also be pulled down if people want some privacy. The foundations of the house, <clears throat> that's the part beneath the floor, are raised slightly. Um, in the past, the height was linked to the importance of the occupants, which we'll talk about another time. However, the floor of the house was usually covered with river stones, Today, we have a range of methods for balancing the temperature inside a building, but the stones on the floor of a Samoan home are ideal for cooling the building on hot days. Now, let's have a close look at the roof. This, as you can see in the picture, is dome-shaped and traditionally thatched or covered with leaves from the sugarcane that's an established crop in Samoa. This was a job for the women and it involved twisting the leaves and then fastening them with a thin strip of coconut leaf before fixing them to the roof in several layers. Now, the shape of the roof is important. You can see that the sides are quite steep and that's done so that the rain falls straight to the ground without moisture going through the leaves and causing leaks or dampness inside the house. Then you'll notice how high the top of the roof is. This is a way of allowing heat to rise on sunny days and go through the thatching, thereby cooling the house. So, how does the house stay upright? Well, there are a number of evenly spaced posts inside. They, um, they encircle the interior of the building and go up to the roof and support the beams there. They're also buried, uh, usually about a metre and a half in the ground to keep them firm. These posts are produced using local timber from the surrounding forests. They're cut by men from the family or village, and the number varies depending on the size and importance of the house. 
Now, these posts were a very significant part of Samoan culture and did much more than hold up the roof. When there were meetings, people sat with their back to certain posts, depending on their status in society. So there were posts for chiefs, according to their status, and posts for speakers and so on. And ordinary people sat around the side on mats. The last area I want to look at today is the attachment of the beams and posts, what you call fixing the construction. Traditionally, no nails or screws were used anywhere in such a building. Instead, coconut fibres were braided into rope to fix the beams and posts together. The old people of the village usually made and plaited the rope. This was a lengthy process. An ordinary house used about 40,000 feet of this rope. And as you can see in this picture, the rope was pulled very tightly and wound round the beams and posts in a complex pattern. And in fact, the process of tying it to the beams so that it was tight and strong enough to keep them together is one of the great architectural achievements of Polynesia. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute. Thank you for using IELTS Listening Test. There is a good news for you guys. Now you can practice unlimited speaking tests on our application Baby Code. I know, I know, some people will say कि मैं तो अपने friends के साथ प्रैक्टिस कर लेता हूँ. मैं अपने इंस्टिट्यूट में रोज टेस्ट देता हूँ. या मैं मिलर के सामने प्रैक्टिस करता हूँ. लेकिन रोज एक या दो टेस्ट देना is not enough to clear IELTS. और आपके friends और मिलर आपको valuable feedback कभी नहीं दे सकते. लेकिन अगर आप Baby Code application use करते हो, तो आप कहीं भी और कभी भी unlimited test दे सकते हो. Baby code pe practice karna is like having a personal teacher. App will take exam like a real examiner. After test, you can check your grammar, fluency, or pronunciation mistakes. Even you can check your band score. This app will provide you free test every day. So do not forget to try. Link in the description. But if you need more test access, it will just cost you three ninety nine. Wait. If you use my promo code IELTS fifty. That will give you even more fifty rupees discount. Now it's like a one-time meal money, but this will help you to crack your IELTS exam.